Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. Good morning. My name is John the Baptist, and I am not worthy to untie the sandals of the one who will be here next week. I am so excited for you. You're even smarter than I thought. Your search committee did an amazing job. And when I heard that Mike Kinman had been called to be your next rector, I was like, duh, of course. He's like the perfect person for here. I have followed him, I have known him, I have loved him for a long time. And you are in for a treat and you are in for trouble. <laughs> it, But it'll be gospel trouble. It really will be. Now, as you prepare to receive him, I want to remind you of some things that actually you already know, but in the next week or month or year, there are gonna be times when you forget these things and I want you to remind each other about them. Uh, uh, one is, you're going to be preparing Mike Kinman's first day, Kinman's first day, with Ed Bacon's last day. And you need to remember that Ed Bacon wasn't Ed Bacon, or at least the one we know, when he came here. You helped make him Ed Bacon, the one we know and love. And you will help Mike Kinman to become the Mike Kinman we know and love. Let me also remind you that we already have a Messiah. <laughs> and, and Mike isn't him. <laughs> he's a really good guy, but he's not the Messiah. And you'd best not expect him to be. Besides which, by the way, Jesus made just about everybody mad. I mean, be careful what you pray for, <laughs> right? Let me tell you uh, what I value so much about Mike. For a straight white guy, he really gets, he gets a lot. He gets... <laughs> I mean, straight white guys, you know, get... They get blamed for a lot of stuff, but there's some really great straight white guys around. Some of them are sitting right here. Mike Kinman took me to Ferguson, Missouri. And two years ago when Mike Brown was shot, Mike Kinman left the confines of the cathedral in St. Louis and went to offer himself in Ferguson, to learn in Ferguson. Not an easy thing to do in such a racially charged time and place. I wanted to make a pilgrimage to Ferguson and I knew that Mike was the person to go with me and he graciously consented to taking me there and I could tell by the way the people there talked to him. I could see in their eyes their deep abiding trust of him. I could see why he knew that the right response to Black Lives Matter was not all lives matter. This is, a, this is a human being who is able to put himself in the place of so many of the marginalized and then bring that to the rest of us. Do you know where he is this morning? Do you know where he's worshiping right now? He's at St. Barnabas here in Pasadena. 
the church that all saints built for the household help that served the people of this church. God forbid they would be invited to worship here. Yeah? That tells you something about Mike Kinman and the kind of broad, incredibly expansive vision he has of God's glorious reign. He is uh, an amazing human being. And you are in for a wild ride, so buckle up. (laughs) And he's got so much to teach you and so much to learn from you. It is going to be a wonderful relationship. So uh, love him the way you've loved your former rectors. And this will be a wonderful relationship. He probably would have loved to have preached this morning because of this um, (laughs) really funny lesson from Isaiah, right? Uh, And thank you for the way you read it. It's just exactly right. I mean, God is basically saying... God is basically saying, enough already. Enough with the pretty buildings, enough with the lovely music, enough with the, the flowers and the whatevers. I, it doesn't mean anything unless you're participating in church and worship of me actually transforms your lives. This comes from the very uh, earliest part of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was actually written over a period of about 400 years by different people, different groups of people, and it falls into three sections, and we call them 1st Isaiah, 2nd Isaiah, and 3rd Isaiah, although it's all one book. The earliest is 1st Isaiah, from which this passage is taken, uh, is when the people of Israel uh, have been uh, pretty evil, pretty high on themselves, pretty inattentive and uncaring to the marginalized. And so this passage Uh, This first part of Isaiah is the first part of what we are taught as uh, uh, is our ministry as a priest, which is to afflict the comfortable. The second part is about comforting the afflicted, because in the second Isaiah, the people of Israel have been carried off into captivity, into Babylon, uh, and and they are uh, they are suffering. And second Isaiah is reminding them that they will be restored. They are going to come back to Jerusalem because God has not forgotten them and God will restore them. It's comforting the afflicted. And then they get back to Jerusalem and their old ways come back and we're back to afflicting the comfortable. Both of those things, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, are parts of our ministry. And... And this parish church is meant to do both of those things. And Mike will assist you in that. Basically, what what this portion of Isaiah is telling us is that, dare I say it, the system is rigged. (laughs) Never thought you'd hear that here, did you? This this portion of Scripture is is addressed to the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah, our old friends Sodom and Gomorrah. But, of course, Sodom and Gomorrah, we know from the book of Ezekiel, is not about sexuality in any way. It, It is about greed. It is about an excess of food, and it is about ease at the expense of others. That was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. People who were wealthy kept it all for themselves and treated the marginalized horribly. And then the second part of this system that is rigged is that the religious leaders of the time colluded with those who were in power, required expensive sacrifices, which caused an undue burden on the poor. By the way, I meant to mention this in the forum and didn't. Have you noticed how the poor are never mentioned in presidential politics? 
I mean, I like the middle class. I like being in the middle class. But why don't we ever hear about the poor anymore? Yeah? So God is saying, enough already. Enough. I, all that stuff you do in church, it doesn't mean beans to me if it doesn't transform your lives. So enough already. Change, change the way you understand the world. See the world through my eyes, God is saying to us. Right now, at this time in our country, we seem, it seems so difficult for us, doesn't it, to understand the lives of people who are different from us. Seeing other people's lives the way God sees them. And it's awfully hard to treat people you're that irritated by as the children of God that they are. And God is saying, if, if that isn't what church does for you, then enough already. I believe that Mike Kinman is the person to lead you further into that deep understanding of every person being a child of God. It's, it's a cliche, I know it. But look at how far away from that we are. At, the, at this moment in time. Look how hard it is for us to understand the lives of others. Mike Kinman is going to take you on a journey. Mike Kinman is going to urge you to have experiences that will broaden and deepen your faith and broaden and deepen your love for humankind. And they will not necessarily be experiences in this building. Get out of here. Enough already. Get out of here. This is a filling station, right? You don't go to the filling station and fill up your car with gas and then sit there and let the car run until you're low on gas again. You actually put gas in your car so you can go somewhere. And then you come back when you're feeling empty and you want to be filled up again. So get out of here. Enough already. This is good. The music's great. The flowers are pretty and we love this building. But get out of here. <laughs> Enough already. Let the gospel transform your life. It's a decision you've got to make. There's a, uh, a story that comes out of my old diocese in New Hampshire, and if you know New Hampshire at all, you know that in the very center of it, there's a, a big lake, Lake Winnipesaukee. And uh, there was a, an old guy uh, who was uh, like a renowned fisherman. This guy caught fish like nobody could believe. And in fact, they were going through a very uh, difficult time when nobody was catching anything on Lake Winnipesaukee, except this guy was catching his limit every day. And so uh, some of the guys there became a little bit suspicious, and so they, they called the um, uh, 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 fish and game uh, department and said, you better send somebody up here. This, I, this guy may be up to no good. So, so sure enough, a, a game warden came up, and uh, a sort of undercover and, and said to this old guy, can I go out fishing with you? And he said, well, of course. So they go out onto the lake and he says, I'll take you over to this cove where I have, usually have really good luck. So they get there, they drop the anchor and the old fisherman takes a stick of dynamite out of his uh, tackle box and lights it and tosses it in the lake. Boom, there's a big explosion and hundreds of fish just float up to the surface. At which point, the game warden shows him his badge and says, I'm the game warden, you're under arrest. The old fisherman just reaches into the tackle box and pulls out a second stick of dynamite, 
and lights it and tosses it to the game warden and says, are you going to just sit there or are you going to fish? <laughs> You've got a new rector coming. And you've got a marvelous journey ahead of you. And you've got a decision to make. Will you be transformed? Are you going to just sit there? Or are you going to fish? Amen. Amen.